everyone, and welcome to the Reading Party Podcast with Megan and Lexi. Together, we'll watch, snack, and chat our way through books and films set in the ancient world. We bring our expertise as ancient historians to the table to dissect every detail. We hope you'll grab your favourite beverage and snacks and join us every week on this adventure. Before we start spilling the tea, a brief note on our content. The Reading Party podcast is created for adult audiences. The stories of the ancient world are full of violence and undisguised sexual content, and your hosts aren't afraid to curse up a storm. For those reasons, this podcast is not suitable for under 18s, and certain episodes may not be suitable for those living with trauma. This season, we're focusing on stories set in ancient Egypt, and we'll be bringing in guest hosts that are subject matter experts to help us really dig into the history of what we're reading and watching. With that in mind, let's get going. Lexi and I have our teas and are so ready to start spilling the tea on a ton of ancient stories. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Reading Party podcast. Today we're having a slight departure from what we've been doing the rest of the season. We don't have an Egyptological guest, instead we are joined by my husband, Dr. Joshua Bowen, a seriologist and honorary Hebrew Bible scholar. Let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's one way to do it. <laughs> How are you, Joe? I am well. How about you? I am also good. And as ever, we have the wonderful Lexi. How is Lexi? And everyone just missed me telling this fantastic story about how I came home being three quarters wet. Basically, long story short, I got drenched on because I did not bring a coat and had a three quarter broken umbrella to run home with. So, um, but I am changed in dry clothes now and doing much better More if a little tired. Yes, exactly. Well, today we are going to be talking about the animated film, brother, stepbrother, maybe, to Prince of Egypt, which we already spoke about with Rose Campbell. We are talking about Joseph, King of Dreams, which I had not seen before. And it was interesting. It was an enjoyable movie. Not up to the standard of Prince of Egypt, I have to say. The music wasn't quite there, but still, still good. Lexi, had you seen this one before? I have. I don't remember exactly when I chanced upon it. I feel like I was definitely still in high school. So, like, I do have a longer memory with it, but it's true. It's like the sad, sad little brother of Prince of Egypt. Not as well done. I know also Josh had not seen this film. And the reason that we have Josh is because obviously... Joseph, King of Dreams, is based on the Joseph story from the Hebrew Bible. And Josh has, like I, I said, he's an honorary Hebrew Bible scholar. He has done so much Hebrew in grad school and so much like biblical studies. And since leaving grad school, he's kind of, I think, made it his personal mission to take on biblical apologists on the internet. And he's a braver man than I because I'm not touching that with a 10-foot barge pole. But it does mean that he spends an awful lot of time in and around the biblical text. So we thought he would be a good person to have talk about a story that part of it does take place in Egypt, but it's it's a, a Hebrew Bible story. So, Josh, what did you think of the movie first? Like, first impressions? I cried at a couple of points. I'm not ashamed to admit that. No, I, I thought overall... It started kind of slowly for me, a little, it was a little hammy, maybe in the beginning. And part of it, I'm sure, had to do with the fact that our five year old was sitting next to us, well, he's six now, <laughs> crying about uh, whether Joseph was going to be able to take that tree with him out of the jail uh, or was he going to just leave it behind. Things that our children cry about are never what I expect them to cry about. Like, he wasn't bothered by Joseph's brothers selling him into slavery, wasn't bothered by Joseph being thrown into prison. He was deeply like traumatized 
by the fact that this, I think it's an olive tree, this tree that Joseph kind of nurtures and looks after, can he take it with him when he, he's sitting there with like tears running down his face. So Josh and I at the end, Josh very sensibly said, oh, look, there's the tree in the corner of the screen. He took it with him to his house. Like, fantastic. Perfect. 10 out of 10 parenting. There. <laughs> Lie to your kids. I guess that's the moral here. For like a uh, good reason. Well, I mean, it's possible that that's what they were going for, you know, in the upper right hand corner of the tree. But no, I, I honestly thought, obviously there was some artistic license taken with the story, but I think overall it was sort of keeping in keeping with the sort of the major movements of the biblical narrative. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was, it was better than I anticipated it would be. I'll say that as far as, you know, accuracy is concerned. So no, I, I, I enjoyed it. I did want to ask, because it's been a hot minute since I read Joseph's story from the Bible. The movie opens with this amazing piece of parenting and an amazing song uh, called Miracle Child, where Joseph's parents are essentially singing about the fact that he is a miracle and so much better than his brother's. And it was really sad because it, it, at the very beginning, Joseph's brothers are all like excited and happy. They have another brother. Yay, they're going to teach him how to be a family. It's really sweet. And then it kind of kicks into his parents singing about he's a miracle and he's so much better and more special and more precious than all of them. And then they make him this lovely coat. And his brothers are just standing there essentially in work like farm outfits, like you would expect, given that they're what Canaanite shepherds. And he's in this cloth of gold type garment and they're looking at each other like what the fuck and as as a parent in a blended family this is not how you do it like this is not a good way to integrate your respective children with each other this is a, a it's like an exercise in alienating your your new son from his siblings and his brother so that was sad. I wanted to ask, how much of that do we get in the biblical story? Obviously, there's jealousy and resentment because, you know, his brothers sell him into slavery. But how much of it is, like, do we see it being driven by the parents or is it just something that happens? Yeah. I mean, so the story sort of starts, I don't have it in front of me, so if I get the chapters wrong, please forgive me, but it's somewhere back around Genesis 30. And, you know, of course, Jacob has has fled from his brother Esau after, you know, stealing the birthright from him. He goes to live uh, at his mother's uh, to, with, with her brother, Lavan or Laban, out in um, Adoniram. And uh, so he's there for, you know, a while serving his uncle. And during that time, he meets Rachel, you know, his cousin, essentially. and. Uh, he falls in love with her, and but she's the younger sister of two, and Leah is her her older sister. But he loves Rachel, so you know, th without going into all the details, like he little trick is played on Jacob, which is sort of a, a nice literary, you know, part. It's 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 a it's a nice uh, play that the the author makes here because of course Jacob is the trickster, right? And so he gets this trick played on him by his uncle. And he uh, he ends up marrying Leah first, and then marries Rachel. Uh, but he always like this is this is sort of the thing with Jacob, as with others in the in the patriarchal narrative. He's got his favorites, right? And so his favorite wife is Rachel, and God essentially closes her womb. The text says, so she can't have any kids. And uh, Leah, who is like you know the the, the hated whatever spouse. God has favor, you know, on her, has mercy on her. And she bears, I think, three kids, three or four. And then Rachel, you know, gets really upset. And she says, well, I, you know, God's not letting me have any kids. So here, take my slave and have kids with her so that I can, you know, I can have kids as well. And they, legally, they would have been considered hers. And so have some some children there. Then Leah, she can't have babies anymore at the moment. So she gives her slave to Jacob to have some kids. And then 
uh, finally, Rachel is able to have a child, and so she has Joseph. So in that context, I mean, you can kind of see God has kept Rachel from having kids, and then finally, finally, she's able to have one of her own. And so Rachel is Jacob's favorite, and then Rachel has her first child. And so, like, the story is just sort of primed for Joseph to be this, you know, as they sing in the song, this miracle child, right? And that's you have to say omit most of that backstory. Yes, from yes. the animated you can't really have version. Polygamy. You don't really want to. Have no, polygamy. no, it's not mentioned anywhere that the other boys are in fact Rachel's nephews, as well as stepsons. Kind yeah, of. Yeah, it's maybe. it's uh, you know it's it's complicated. It's, you don't want to have story talking about here. You can have sex with. Put, put it through the Disney Hercules filter is what I always say. I mean, gosh, you know, you have the the sweet little family with Hera and Zeus and Hercules, and it's adorable. And and then you're like, oh, God, the minute you read the mythology, you're like, uh, I was lied to. So I'm sure that it's the same kind of sanitized, wonderful family, although it's not because they all hate their brother. It's great. It's weird. Yeah. Also, the, the, the coat man. That I'm not even gonna lie, like that was a gorgeous coat. And when it looks like you are stuck wearing drab, horrible clothes in the ancient world, yeah, you're gonna be pissed, man. You're gonna be pissed. I'd, have been I'd be pissed. That coat. Yeah, and I want you know, that coat. and and Joseph doesn't, you know, of course, this is all narrative play, right? But you know, Joseph doesn't do himself any favors, you know. So he, so he has these dreams, and he goes and tells them to everybody. Hey, guess what? You guys are all going to like bow down and worship me, mom and dad, you too. And so, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this is, uh, everything is sort of set up in the story for it to make sense that the brothers do what they do. And of course, you know, we can talk about it if you want when we get there, but there's complications with the story of him being sold literarily. But yeah, I mean, again, I think it's, I think it's set up well. Before we get to the the being sold, when we were watching and Joseph is learning to read and write Egyptian hieroglyphs, there was a snigger to my left from a certain gentleman who shall remain nameless. What would people in Canaan have been reading and writing? Do well, we know? I mean, would he have been able to read and write? Yeah, I mean, probably not, right? I, I guess it just depends on what. Sorry, it's difficult to answer that question because it assumes the historicity of the text, right? Or of the story, and of course. That's fair. If we're going by the biblical timeline, you know, we're thinking of Old Babylonian period, maybe. So, of course, you know, there's obviously reading and writing is something that people do, right? But to what extent? And, uh, you know, people that are pastoral nomads, probably not going to be participating in in you know Canaan, they're, they're probably not going to have access to that that type of education. I can't remember what it is that I laughed at specifically, though. He's sitting there writing hieroglyphs. Yeah, which seems a little incongruous. Anyway, does does the Bible like say that he was trained in writing? Not that I not that I recall. Right, obviously Moses in the narrative would have been would have fit that bill. But of course, Moses is, yeah, according to the narrative, centuries later. Or so, and of course, he was raised in the Egyptian court, right? So that's you know a very different circumstance from Joseph, who's you know tending sheep. I'm gonna just go with like you. You probably aren't gonna teach a shepherd to read and write. I mean, reading and writing is as much as in the modern world. I want to be like, yes, we should all be very learned and have the opportunity to do so. Yeah, back then, nah. Are you kidding? It's like a it was like privilege of the rich people. So I I would be like very skeptical that he would be. I don't know. I mean, it plays well, right, to the rest of the film, you know, because once he's in Egypt and they're like, oh, you're a learned slave. <gasps> like, you can do so many things. Like, um, it always gets me giggling when, you know, he's he's in his enslavement and then they're like, you have organizational skills, like, so good you could organize Ikea. Like, I organize my my broom closet. And you're like, yes, I got this. And then he does. And I'm like, no, like, what? 
if this were real, he would be an IKEA employee. Okay, that's the like. Mm. Mm. It is. It is funny. What like when you read the story in the Hebrew Bible, like everywhere he goes, he's he's placed in charge. Right when he's in Potiphar's house, you know, he's placed in charge. When uh, you know the thing happens with Potiphar's wife, uh, and he's thrown in prison, he's you know the the the, the prison guard makes him in charge of charge of all the prisoners so that and the text has this sort of repeated thing where he says uh that he he didn't think about anything to do like the, the, the like the person in charge of the prisoners didn't think at really anything to do with the prisoners anymore now that joseph was there like he's it's just completely under his charge so yeah i mean I, I think that's just sort of that that i think is you know narratively driven that's why i say i feel like there were many things that like the whole thing with Rachel being alive and, you know, celebrating Joseph and everything, you know, Rachel, Rachel dies in childbirth, uh, giving birth to Benjamin, the youngest brother. And so like, you know, when, when Joseph sold, you know, it's not like this great morning to, she, she's already, she's already gone. So what, so what happens with the selling of, of Joseph? Cause I know, in the text, there's a little bit of a kerfuffle in there, and I wanted to get your your opinion on how the movie handled it. Yeah, I mean, best they could, right? They made a choice and they went with it. And I, I think they're probably following what the canonical form is trying to say. When you read through the passage, and it's if you read it probably like in the King James or in the New King James. Uh, I haven't looked at it in those, but I, just given the nature of the of the translation, I suspect it would be clearer. You would see the problems more than if you read the NIV. The NIV really tries to smooth things out. The NIV is sort of doing what the movie's doing. But if you read Genesis 37, it's very problematic. Um, and if people are interested, please go read Joel Baden's book on the formation of the Pentateuch, because he, he lays this out very, very well. But essentially, you know, you read it through and at one point it's it's the the brothers throw him into this well into this you know dry cistern and then they go sit down and have a meal and then midianite traders come by and pull him up out uh, of the cistern and then then the text says that they sell him to ishmaelite traders who are different and then the ishmaelite traders take joseph down to egypt but then s- do they sell him to uh, one place you know it, it talks about they take him down but then the midianites sell him to potiphar's house but then a little bit later it says the ishmaelites sell him so you know obviously what's happening here is you have two different traditions that are sort of being tried to the editor is trying to like weave them together without deleting either tradition and i think he does a decent job but still it's it's very confusing what's going on i again i think that what the, the movie did is you can't have this confusion in the movie that would that wouldn't play very well and so i think they just make a decision that yeah you've got to have traders that are going to take him down we're going to have the brothers selling them to these these midianite traders and just move on with life and actually this is the sort of thing that ancient interpreters of the text did so in the retelling of the joseph story in later um later texts I think it plays in the Genesis Apocryphon from Qumran. I think the story is there. You know, they just sort of delete one of the traditions. You know, they just they just sort of delete the problem, which again makes sense uh, if you're telling a story trying to make it clear. I thought they handled it well. Well, I'm sure again you got to put it through that simplify everything filter. But it's it's interesting because once we get him, one once Joseph gets. In into Egypt and, and is sold ostensibly by those just those people, whatever. But yeah, it's it's funny because once he's there, he seems to start by cleaning the floors and then gets whooshed up, and they're like, "You're talented," but also I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's not how it would have worked. So I wanted to ask whether that is. I mean, you you said he was like put in charge of stuff, but I'm also just like you don't just suddenly go from like cleaning the floors to managing your IKEA bureau, you know, the next day. So I'm just like, I'm sure that is not 
very accurate. And I mean, did he have a meteoric rise in terms of the the household things? Because they tried to show him like moving up the ranks of in tasks, right, for his servitude. But I'm like, I have no idea if that's true or if that's just jumbled showing him doing things. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's it's very well in keeping with the narrative. You know, again, the idea behind this, as with all the stories in the patriarchal narrative, is that that God sometimes very overtly, sometimes very subtly, is causing these the ancestors, these early Israelite fathers, to become very, very prosperous and very, very successful. So you know when you when you think about abraham for example you know abraham ends up doing something that the reader thinks you shouldn't be doing that but in the end even in spite of you know that faulty decision he comes out super rich and and the text says that god blesses him with this right so this sort of thing of miraculous intervention sometimes even very subtly miraculous intervention in order to make the um, you know, this this uh, patriarch, you know, really really successful, that is sort of the theme that runs throughout Genesis. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that's what's going on here. No matter what Joseph puts his hand to, is the idea. No matter what, God makes him successful, and so he becomes you know very very quickly he's placed in charge of all things in Potiphar's house. And so much so that the text says that Potiphar, if I'm remembering it correctly, Potiphar is only concerned about with what he himself eats. That's it. Just his own food. That's that's all he worries about. Joseph takes care of everything else. So he's like a modern day Jeeves. <laughs> right. right. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, he's certainly still a slave. Uh, we don't want to we don't want to miss that. Well. Jeeves is the indentured butler, so I guess we'll just have the ancient version of uh, enslaved Jeeves, but he's like Jeeves. Where does Potiphar's niece come in? Is this completely made up for the movie? I am assuming it is. It's been a little bit since I've actually read, but I don't remember. I mean, I think he, he does eventually marry toward the end, that part of the story. So what for those who haven't seen the movie, what happens is Joseph, while he's a slave in Potiphar's household, starts flirting with Potiphar's niece, and then he gets thrown into jail for supposedly assaulting Potiphar's wife. It's not what happens. She comes on to him and he's like, no, I could not betray my master. Unwisely, in all honesty, very unwise. So she screams and, well, I mean, people make make the assumptions that you would expect them to. So he gets thrown in jail. And then Potiphar's niece, she has a name. I honestly can't remember it. I'm, yeah, it's a running theme that I'm so bad with names. But she kind of sneaks up to the jail in the rain and lets down a basket of food on a rope. And it's really sweet. And then when he's freed and kind of elevated in rank by Pharaoh, for some reason, Joseph is just wandering around her house one day. That's not actually explained and he gives the cat a bowl of milk which is a whole whole other thing and then kind of cuts to them getting married and they have a couple of adorable children it's very very lovely but yes probably not terribly accurate in terms of historicity yeah i mean he he certainly does have children in Egypt, this, the, you know, as the story plays out, and we'll probably talk about this, when the, the family ultimately comes down to get grain, they eventually all move down. And the story, again, I don't remember how many kids he ends up having, but uh, Joseph Joseph does have his own children down there, and it sort of lays that out. But yeah, so I mean, I, the, the love story angle, of course, I think is, you know, just, just played up for the viewer, but. I mean, they they did it well for a sanitized children's movie. What's her name? It's on the tip of my tongue. Wait. Osana, I think. I think. I'm better with names, but not great. So Osana, yes. Yeah, she... Okay, fun fact. I can't... Like, like once I, I knew, I knew, and it ruins the entire thing for me because I can't not... I can't unsee it. Uh, she's voiced by Jodie Benson, who's the voice of The Little Mermaid. 
So every time she comes in and starts talking, I'm just like, you're Ariel. I, I don't care who you are. You're Ariel and you are doing things. And then she has this beautiful little song, which actually, though, is my second favorite song in the whole film. I do love her song. It's so beautiful and so different from what Ariel would sing, I think, which is also what amuses me very, very deeply, which is why I love it. But yeah, I think it's it's an interestingly done montage i i felt like in several places they tried to emulate the prince of egypt like you have sort of her coming and seeing joseph like painting his family and then the 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 style of like the the murals the visual elements and even down to the animations when they do animate them i i found that they were really close to that one animation of moses when he's like in the temple kind of singing his classic I want song. And then it's mirrored because then you have Joseph singing his, well, humming or whatever, his kind of I want sentiments. It's it's interesting how they they tied those two together. I'm just I I notice a lot of the visual elements. Did anyone else notice that or is it just me? I I didn't, but now you've mentioned it 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 is absolutely there. I really liked the dream sequences because they looked like they stepped right out of a Van Gogh painting. And like, also kind of a cheap knockoff of Prince of Egypt, <laughs> though. Like, yes, I'm sorry, true. I was like, it, but like, because the animation was like trying to mimic, but you're like, oh, DreamWorks, like, this is not it. This ain't it. You should have just gone differently. But yeah, it was, it was interesting. I did, I do like the dream sequences. I, I can't lie. Those, those were pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. And that part, right, is in the Bible. If I if I remember correctly, I look, man, I grew up Jewish, but I did not touch a Bible ever. So I'm like, I'm very late to the party. I had to learn all of these things in like high school or later. But I'm pretty sure, right, you, you did have the fellow prisoner who was, for some reason, carted off to Pharaoh. I think it was because he was like told the meaning of a dream or something, right? Did they get that part right? Or am I just thinking that that is a bigger deal than it was. I don't remember. Yes, they definitely did get it right. Sorry about that. I can't believe that I forgot this, but just to kind of go back for a second, because it's such an important part of the story. Joseph has two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and it's, there's that whole story. I love MS. It just it makes your brain stop working periodically. But it's that whole story about how um, he brings... Ephraim and Manasseh up to be blessed uh, by his father Jacob, and he, Jacob's like switches hands. He's supposed to put his like right hand on the older son and left hand on the younger son. He switches them and like switches the blessings. It's all the same same sort of theme. I just can't believe I blanked on all that. Anyway, but yeah, I mean, I think they. I also think they did well on the on the dream sequences. I think they, you know, sort of got the main point throughout. Maybe it wasn't you know exactly precise. And what the text says that he dreamed. But I mean, this whole theme about interpreting dreams is something that, you know, you see throughout the biblical text. And in fact, it's it's funny because it, as I was watching it, it reminded me of the book of Daniel. Because in the book of Daniel, which is obviously a much later text, at least as far as the narrative is concerned, it's certainly a later text chronologically. But, you know, Daniel is uh, does does something similar for King Nebuchadnezzar the Neo-Babylonian king. But there, in the Aramaic section of the book, Nebuchadnezzar has this terrible dream and it really scares him. And so he calls all his wise men <laughs> in front of him and, and says, all right, time to do some dream interpreting. And of course, the reader at this point, if they've, if they've gone through the canonical form of the text, they, like, they know very well that you know a king says, all right, here's what I dreamed. And then the dream interpreters tell him what it means, right? Super cool. Sort of unfalsifiable, right? Unless they just sit around and wait to see if this thing actually happens. What's the king going to say? Like, but Nebuchadnezzar's clever. And he says, I want you to not only tell me what the dream means, I want you to tell me what it is that I dreamed. Right? So tell me the dream and then tell me its interpretation. And yeah, it's pretty clever. Of course, they respond with, do huh <laughs> you can't you can't ask us to do that that's not fair one of the earliest one of the earliest that i know of phrases uh nebuchadnezzar says to them i see that you are buying time 
which I think is a pretty cool, pretty cool thing to see kind of early. But yeah, anyway, that's um, I to answer your question in the most roundabout way, a human being could. Yeah, I think uh, I think they captured the dreams reasonably well. Also, the dreams kind of the the dreams kind of help, but don't help at the same time. Like like ah, oh, I, I I like, but I hate it at the same time because the whole film essentially you don't have a good concept of how much time passes right so you're like how long is he in the dungeon and then you're like well so the dream sets the stage where it's like seven years will go by and then once we hit the famine it's like after seven so i'm like okay so that i get that that's seven years because it's told to us i have no concept of time out of any of this so i'm just like always a bit annoyed that I'm like, okay, so that's seven years. So I'm just like, how old were you? And how old are you now? I don't know this. Like, I, it makes me very angry for some apparent reason. I don't know. I like to know when time, how time works. I don't know. Um, but yeah. So, so what is our actual timeline outside of this seven year period from when he tells Pharaoh, you have seven years essentially to get all your food because then you're fucked. Yeah, I think he was in prison for two years following the interpretation of the dream. I, I think that's correct. Yeah, I should probably look at these things up and then people would know. That, that explains just... how the tree got quite large. Yeah, because I was going to say it, it had to like, unless this tree is like a fast growing tree or unless there's like divine intervention, like in Greek mythology, where they're like, tree, be grown. Bring. Yeah, I, I think that's what it was. I, I should probably just look, but it might not be that important, but I can do I, that. I wanted to ask, when they come to Egypt from Canaan during the famine to get grain, in the movie, Joseph is really mad at them. Understandably, you know, they did sell him into slavery. I think I would be, even after several years, I'd be quite perturbed with my siblings. But... He's really mad at them. And this kind of anger carries over for a, like quite a, a large portion of the film. And obviously he puts the cup in Benjamin's sack of grain and then says, oh, you, you stole it. I'm going to throw you in jail. In the Bible, in the biblical text, is there any clue as to the motivation? Is this a revenge thing in the original text or is this something that they've kind of worked into the film to give more? more of a rounded response. I think that it's meant, so the text does say that like Joseph pretended to be angry or to speak angrily or something to that effect to them. So I, I think that not having read it in full for a little bit and just going from memory here, I, I, I th and I probably just should have done that for this uh, podcast. I apologize. It's all good. But we spend I, most of uh, most episodes on like wild goose chases. This is <laughs> absolutely not a problem. But I think that if we just take a step back for a second, the whole point of the Joseph story, um, at least according to a pretty major way of viewing the formation of the Pentateuch or of the Torah, is the Joseph story is like the mortar that connects the patriarchal narrative of Genesis 12 to 30, 35, 36, whatever it is, to the Exodus story, right? Because both of, both of these are origin stories. Where did the Israelites come from? Well, the patriarchal narrative has them coming from, or the Chaldeans, but specifically, probably in its earliest form, just coming out of Canaan, right? That's where they originated as pastoral nomads. And the Exodus has them coming out of Egypt. So these are two distinct origin stories. When the editor is bringing these things together, he's asking the question, or however one views the documentary hypothesis or the traditional historical view, whatever, asking the question, how do, we, how do we connect these two blocks and make this make sense? So with Joseph, it's like you have two bricks and you put mortar in between to connect them, to make them one coherent story. And Joseph explains why it is that Israel can have its origins in Canaan, but then also have its later origins out of Egypt. So Joseph goes down to Egypt, 
And then ultimately is that that's the catalyst to bring everybody down to Egypt. And once everybody's down in Egypt, now they're out of Canaan. So they've had their origin there and now they develop for several centuries. And then they have this origin 2.0 out of, out of Egypt. So I think this is the point that the, the narrative is trying to sort of drive at is how does Joseph get his family down there? Right. And I think what, what he's doing is he's trying to ascertain, at least in the canonical form, I think he's trying to ascertain the situation, right? He's got his brothers here, but what about his dad, his younger brother? He wants to see his younger brother. He knows he's not going to be able to get him down there. Otherwise, like, because nobody's going to let Jacob's definitely not going to let Benjamin out of his sight, having lost Joseph. So I think that there's a lot of a lot of that at play there. But I mean, I, I, I if I remember correctly, the text specifically does say something like he, he essentially feigns anger. So I don't I don't know. I, I suspect that's just, you know, overplayed as far as what the narrative was intending. The, the anger side in the movie. He was quite he was pissed. Like he was super pissed. And his, his wife was very confused. Very confused. This is, sorry, I know I keep asking you very, very specific questions, and that's unfair because I didn't tell you to read. <laughs> Did you read Joseph before we, we I essentially just told Josh, we're going to watch this movie and then we're going to talk about it on a podcast. And he said, okay. And God bless him, he's doing it. <laughs> she's super mad. Well, she's super confused because he's literally just like, because from her perspective, right, he sees this family coming and begging for help who should be theoretically no different from any of the other families coming and begging for help and then to see your husband like lash out and be like and now one is in prison one has stolen from me and now i lock you away but now you also need to come back and do the thing she's probably says like just like what the fuck is happening right now which is so it's interesting to see how they've done it and but it's hard to look at it without seeing the narrative contortions they need to make it fit which always made it an awkward fit i don't know it's it's funny because i because i want to say like most people would probably have the familiarity of coming into these this film probably with prince of egypt having seen it already but also maybe probably being familiar just with these two bible stories it's it's like the it's it's like you're building a, a Lego pyramid, right? And then it's like you you basically have the scaffolding and you're just trying to fit the Legos into the scaffolding in a, in a pattern where you're like, I don't know if this is right. It just needs to fit in the scaffolding because it's built, which is a terrible way to have to sort of do things, I think, creatively. But there's they don't give themselves a lot of room. So I think a lot of the things that would spark questions or thoughts, for me at least when watching, I, I honestly think I can mostly pair them down to just that being the reason. Like we're we're already familiar, so you have to fit it to what people are expecting, kind of in a way. But also, it's creative entertainment, so you're supposed to try to be different. But different doesn't really work here. That's the reason I don't really love doing Bible stories because I'm like people know them and they get they tend to get very angry when you change them in ways that you could really be creative. So, yeah, there's this, that. Something that, that I did find very interesting about this one is there's a disclaimer at the beginning of the film saying, essentially, we had to change things, but we hope it's like still recognizable as the story beloved by millions worldwide or, or whatever. And that's not something, I mean, obviously, in, in a lot of biographical movies, you get the, even like, names have been changed to preserve anonymity or... This is based on a true story, but it's like events have been changed. I, I don't usually see that kind of thing on an animated story based on a biblical narrative. And I think you're right. I think there's a lot of, because in our culture, at least Bible stories are so ubiquitous, even without having read the Bible, you're going to have an idea of who Joseph is and who Moses is and a vague understanding of their like the, the outline of their story. And I think because there's that general knowledge just kind of floating around in the ether of Western culture, but also there are so many people who are very enthusiastic 
let's say, about the Bible and biblical narratives. So changing stuff really does upset people, which you're right, it stymies, it, it stunts a lot of what could be really creative directions. And I think we saw we saw when we did our, our first season with the Iliad and the Odyssey, we saw some very creative directions. I mean, not always good creative directions, but very creative directions that people are obviously feel much more comfortable taking because they don't have this like cultural obligation, I think, to stick to the narrative that everyone's familiar with. What's interesting to me about it, at least in this regard, is the way that Jacob is kind of protected here from getting a bad rap, right? Like one of the sort of subtle things that happens in the narrative that, you know, obviously doesn't happen in the movie is that at the part where, who is it, the Simeon that is kept, I think, while the other brothers go back, the text says after they had eaten all of the grain that they had gotten from their first trip to Egypt, only then does Jacob say, go back down to Egypt, not to get your brother, but to buy a little more grain, lest we die because the famine was still severe. And that's a pretty interesting point, I think, because the scenario is essentially this, according to the canonical version, the brothers come back minus one with the instructions, don't come back unless you bring Benjamin, the youngest. Once you bring him back, then I'll let all of you go. And Jacob doesn't do it. <laughs> I mean, really, the way that you read it, the, the story is just like, well, sucks to be that guy. Let's eat, right? I mean, like, and it's only after they run out. So it's not like, all right, guys, here, you know, get, get your provisions and Benjamin, get ready. And they have to convince Jacob, even after all of that, listen, I will personally guarantee his safety. Like, don't, they see, he said, don't come back unless you bring your brother, your youngest brother. So, I mean, this really puts Jacob in a very bad light, right? And of course, I think the, the, the movie is intending to spare him that, right? You want, you want this sort of clear good guy, bad guy delineation. And even though Jacob, the story couldn't protect him from, showing favoritism i think it protects him as much as it can you know in 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 these sorts of finer points of the story he's definitely not as shady maybe a character in in the movie as he's depicted in the in the bible especially with the whole like marrying multiple women and which I know is is not a shady thing in the ancient world, but I feel if you put that in a kid's movie, people might be a little, it might raise some eyebrows. Shady is a shady does, man. You know, it's funny because when you were mentioning, you know, how we've seen some very creative adaptations, Odysseus Voyage to the Underworld, cough, cough, comes right to mind. But yeah, you know, it's it's interesting and and you know we're not afraid to be controversial here so I will not give a damn about being controversial. Um yeah, so we so we know that changing bible stories makes people very angry for many different reasons. But I don't care because I honestly treat bible stories like I treat mythology from anywhere and I know people are going to be like <gasps> don't care. But um so if we did want to if we wanted to try to like make this a little more interesting and not just so um, boringly like trying to hit the tease, you know, I'm, I'm I was kind of curious like how would what would you guys change? Like how could you spice this up? Because I have thoughts on how I would spice this up, but I think I'd just end up really ruining it and taking it very far away from the original. I mean, if, if we're following some of the adaptations we've seen for the Iliad and the Odyssey, we could just make everyone vampires. Like, oh, do you like a Twilight 
Joseph Technicolor Dreamcoats adaptation. That would be awful. I would watch that in a heartbeat. That would be awful, but amazing. The thing that I think, it's clear that what, you know, the, the producer or whatever of the movie was trying to do, the moral that, that they were trying to get across was like one of forgiveness. And I think that in order to develop some of that you know, narrative tension, uh, they have to have Joseph get angry. Throughout most of the movie, he's a pretty forgiving, you know, easygoing kid, right? He just gets really sad when he's sold into slavery. But it's a, it was a little jarring to me, and maybe that's because I knew the story or whatever, but when he got angry, he he stepped into the role of the bad guy very briefly, right? And I, I, again, I understand why they did it because they're trying to develop that that narrative tension. That, okay, he's 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 going this direction, but ultimately he's going to realize that forgiveness is the way to go. And so, but I think for me, and and certainly this is the biblical trope that you see throughout these stories is, as my grandfather used to always say, stay above board, right? Stay above board, stay above board, is what he always used to say. So when you, when you think about Daniel or you think about, you know, his, his three friends, um, and, you know, in the fiery furnace, all of that, all of those stories, uh, focus and stay centered on, remain faithful, no matter how bad it gets. And I think that the tension is developed in the narrative in different ways. Like you would expect Joseph to get angry. You would expect him to be resentful. But it's but it's in the in the biblical story, I think it's it's God's fidelity um and him counting on God's fidelity that that allows him to remain in this sort of you know, what, do we, what would we call it? Like the God's ways are higher than our ways, you know, sort of mindset. And of course, he says it outright, what you intended. Yeah, and and what, what, what you intended for evil, God intended for good, right? So I think that is something that I would probably at least visit or revisit, whatever, is trying to keep, trying to keep Joseph in that space. I Like, I, I can't believe Joseph is still being unwaver of un, unwaveringly forgiving of his brothers so have some like continued anger and maybe not have the forgiveness thing going on in there i would say maybe like his wife getting angry right sort of like a job play right because you, you you think about the story of job job has all his shit taken from him and 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 then then he has all his kids die, right? And he gets boils, and his wife is the one that comes up and says, "Curse God and die." And Job says, "Am I to take the good from from Yahweh and not take the bad?" Right. So it, it's that feeling of no matter how bad the shit gets, he's not going to do something wrong. And I think that. Maybe having Asana, you know, coming up and saying, I, I, you know, I, I can't believe your brothers would do this to you. We should really get them back or something. And having, having him say, God has a purpose for everything or something, we should, you know, continue to trust him. I think your direction would be more well received. I think I would still prefer the vampires, <laughs> but I think yours is, is much more likely to get actually made <laughs> than mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that definitely would be more likely to be made than vampires. But you know what? Stranger things have happened. I mean, if we can get an Abraham Lincoln vampire slayer made, then we can get this made with vampires. But I was like, wait, no, as you were as you were talking, I was like, wait. So essentially what you're telling me is that uh Joseph is Hector. And what we would like to see is him as Achilles being just pissy and angry. And it doesn't matter what happens. He's just mad. And he's like the perpetual whiny sad boy. 
because I would I would see him if he were like turned into Achilles. That would be that would be fun. I mean, especially after all the great Achilleses that we saw last season, I would be up to to you know doing doing more of that although i do like the idea of vampires although although that could be really overdone because we have so many vampire things so i was kind of like well maybe we should stay vampire biblical adaptations though i feel like this is a new we could be tapping into it could be, but the thing is, like, they don't people like really shy away from the horrible, like, demon thing when you're having, when you, you have, like, these people blessed by God. So, like, tonally, it's like a little too in the opposite direction. So I was, I was Probably. like, I don't know, like, like, turn it more into like Grey's Anatomy situation or like a, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like modern dramas where you're just like, oh, oh, oh no, you know what? No, I want, I want to turn this story into a, a, a King Lear situation actually because king lear is my favorite shakespeare which is interesting because i there's so many good ones but no i turn it into a competition go to the father and be like yes so now you are the arbiter of all things and make us tell you things that you want to hear and if we refuse because of something else we will be disinherited and you will get rid of us like yesterday's trash so let's do intercompetition between the 13 14 by the end siblings what is it yeah it's like 14 by the end because it's like the 12 brothers and him and then benjamin so it's like 14 i don't know i can't count i'm bad at math but uh no actually i, I think i'll go for the for the uh shakespearean-esque king lear or turn into one you know what actually I, we're going so serious with everything let's try into a comedy because biblical comedies i think could be the new big thing but everyone loves like a good rom-com so let's like turn into like some silly the proposal shit It'll be great. It'll be great. Like Twelfth Night, Comedy of Errors. We could go the other direction, right, and make it much more historically reliable. So do like, they're actually ancient aliens. Megan, you're into that. I like the direction you took with this. (laughs) I was prepared for something very serious. I was like, Josh has a dynamite suggestion here, and it's ancient aliens. I mean, hey, I suggested vampires, so I think aliens is a is a perfectly reasonable direction to go in. You know, like we could find out that that Joseph actually is from Nibiru. I mean, I he's an I'm Anunnaki. In. Or or make them all werewolves because all these things seem to happen with the lunar thing because the moon was like a big thing in this movie. I'm sorry, everything happened with like the full moon. He was taken in the middle of the night, stolen away, and sold into slavery at the middle of the night. And if he just like turned into a werewolf because like full moon and then just like went rah on on the like slavers and then he was like and now i shall take myself to egypt and pretend that i was sold into slavery rah you know like like oh that would be really cool actually werewolves i think i think what i'm getting from this discussion is that we are all in the wrong field we should (laughs) resign our respective positions and start a film studio Either that or let's just become experts in like bad folklore and then do a, a, write a bunch of books or produce fil- short films that is like ancient world or ancient stories turned into bad folklore. Perfect. I'm sold. I'm sold. Final thoughts. Lexi, is this a movie you would watch again? I mean, yeah, I've gone back throughout the years and watched it. Strangely, though, I would never go and just watch it on my own being like, you know what? It's a it's a Joseph King of Dreams night. No, usually it does coincide with like, I do kind of have a ritual. I did not have many growing up because we were like the most reform of reformed Jews, which meant we go to temple on Yom Kippur and that's it. So... Yeah, it was definitely more culturally Jewish than anything. But every Passover, because Passover is actually my favorite of the Jewish holidays, which is kind of terrible. But still, the food is delicious. So I've always loved celebrating Passover. So I, this is one of two, two films, I would say, that I you know routinely try to come back to when i when i put it all together so i kind of usually i'll I'll watch this and then i'll do prince of egypt and sort of so so i'll process through the story to put myself in this like biblical mindset right before i go to the seder table and celebrate and talk about how we were slaves and it was terrible that's a really interesting habit i've made for myself but yeah i would i would i would definitely recommend it i think as someone who is not connected to never was and never will be to the bible it probably doesn't hit for me as hard 
as it might for someone who is raised a lot more re- religiously. So I can only say as a casual observer that like, yeah, as someone who didn't really want to read the Bible ever and still doesn't want to read the Bible, I'm like, I don't know if it's ever, you know, I'm, I don't want to go through the work to find out how accurate that is. I'll just stick with the historians who tell me a different story. But it's a fun piece of media with good music. Amazing. Amazing. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed Prince of Egypt more. I think the animation and the songs in Prince of Egypt is slightly better, slash I just prefer them. But it was a decent movie. Uh, I probably won't watch it again just because it's not my normal viewing. Like, it's not something I would I would have necessarily chosen. Also, I've apparently scarred our son for life because of this tree dilemma. So maybe he'll want to watch it again and try and work out what happens with the tree. I'm not sure. <laughs> Josh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think risking pulling that Band-Aid off of Oliver is probably not a wise move if he doesn't. If he doesn't bring it back up, I don't know that I should expose him to the potential trauma of what happens to this tree but uh yeah i mean i it was a fun watch i I thought of course nora also cried yeah i'm still not sure which part i we just it was ah i swear i don't i never expect them to cry at the things they end up crying at i got up so we have movie night on a Monday and we have pizza and we watch a movie. So I got up off the couch to go and get a drink. And Nora, who is nearly three, was sitting on the floor, which is normal for her, just tears on her face. I don't even remember what part of the movie it was. She was just crying. And she had this big, like, pouty lip thing. And I just sat with her and she kind of snuggled into me. I was like, okay, you need to come and sit with the grown ups so we can keep track of who's crying. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, but no, I mean, I, th- I thought it was, I thought it was fun. Not my favorite in the whole wide world. Yeah, I mean, I'll listen to my two favorite songs, and that's kind of it. All also, it's just I'm a big film buff, or I try to be. So it kind of wigs me out that Joseph is voiced by Ben Affleck. So it is like Ben Affleck and Ariel, and that really does things in my mind because it's very confused and those things should never intersect. So I do find it funny when I watch for various reasons. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. And on that note, we will leave it there. But thank you everyone for joining us. Josh, thank you for watching. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a review. And you can also follow us on social media at The Reading Party Podcast. If you'd like to leave us a book or movie suggestion, then email us at thereadingpartypod at gmail.com. See you next week. Mm